Well, well, let's start. First of all, thank you all for, for coming here today. Um, what I want to do is provide a, a bunch of facts, a bunch of figures. Uh, I will admit up front it's not the most uplifting message because the financial challenges facing this nation are severe. They really are. But let's, first of all, start the conversation. I'm hoping we got a relatively bipartisan crowd. I've introduced myself to a bunch of you, and I know I've got some supporters here. I really do hope we've got people in the crowd that don't necessarily agree with me. But, I mean, I always like to, to start these discussions the way I would normally start a business negotiation, which, you know, if you've seen me on media, you, you realize I do kind of like to argue. I think it's actually a pretty good way of, of uh, testing ideas and, and having a flexible mind. And, and trust me, in, in, a, in a discussion, if people have got better information, I'm, I'm willing to change my opinion. I'm, I'm willing to be convinced. But the way I would start a business negotiation is not, I want to sit down and argue right after that. But I would first spend a lot of time figuring out what we agree on. You'll find those areas. What that did in negotiation is, first of all, develop a relationship with whoever you're negotiating with. Also develop a level of trust. So when you got to those areas of disagreement, uh, it was a whole lot easier finding common ground. And, and let's face it, uh, there are a lot of areas of, di of political disagreement in this country. We're a very divided country. But let's start today with one of those areas that I really think Americans agree on. We really do share the same goal. We all want a prosperous America, or Wisconsin, or Madison, or Sun Prairie, or Bristol. We really want our communities to be vibrant. Uh, I'm concerned about every American. I'm sure you are, too. We all want every American to have the opportunity to build a good life for themselves and their families. Now, again, realize there's a wide disparity of opinion in terms of how to provide that prosperity, how, how we can have opportunity for every American. But at least as we start this discussion about these enormous challenges, it's, I think, good not to be questioning each other's motives. I don't question the other sides. I realize this $3.5 trillion uh, federal government entity is really based on good intentions. I would argue, and I hope to be able to show and prove, a lot of very serious negative unintended consequences that we need to understand before we're going to move to our real solutions. And before I get into the PowerPoint presentation, let, let's just talk about, from my standpoint, the overall solution. The number one component really is a robust economy. You, you want to uh, shrink income disparity, which I think is a problem, you do it with economic growth. You do it with a robust economy where employers are competing for, for workers. That's how you drive up wages. That's how you dec decrease that income disparity. But in general, if you want an overall macro I, concept of how you get our economy growing is you have to make America or Wisconsin or Madison, Sun Prairie, Bristol, you have to make it an attractive place for risk taking, for business investment, business expansion, job creation. Conceptually, that's what you have to accomplish. Now, how do you do it? I mean, there again, it's not that difficult. You've got to, you know, we are in a global economy. We don't have the luxury of deciding whether or not we want to compete. We have to compete. And so you have to benchmark your nation or your state or your city against your competitors. Now, now globally, how does America stack up? Well, unfortunately, in terms of business taxes, we've got a very high rate. But we've got the world's largest market. We've got relatively cheap energy prices. So manufacturers actually want to manufacture close to their customers. But if you're a German manufacturer, are you going to site your plant in Toronto where the, the business tax rate is 15% or Detroit where it's 35 you know, unfortunately, that ends up being a clear choice for global manufacturers. We ought to utilize our God-given energy resources. We should keep our energy prices low. If you're going to manufacture things, that requires power. So let's keep the cost of power as low as possible so we can compete with potentially higher labor costs. And then third, you better have a, a less onerous regulatory environment. Currently, America's regulatory costs $1.8 trillion for businesses to comply with every year. $1.8 trillion. Now, let me put that number in perspective. Only 10 economies in the world are larger than $1.8 trillion. So we're burdening our job creators, our businesses, with a regulatory burden that is almost as large, or that's you know, exceeded in size by only 10 economies in the world. That's onerous. I'm not against regulation. We need to have a common sense level so, so we don't disadvantage our businesses. So to me, that's the overall solution. But let, let's start hopping into the problem. Now, this is the first chart I ever produced a seminar. I really wanted to know how big the federal government's been in relationship to the size of our economy over the last hundred years. Um, if you take the viewpoint, again, it's manufacturer root cause analysis, just sort of in my DNA, 
I mean, I really do think the root cause of certainly our financial problems in this nation, but I would say many cultural problems, literally is the size, the scope, all the rules, all the regulation, all the governance intrusion into our lives, the resulting costs of debt and government. So here's the metric that measures that. The size of government in relation to the size of our economy. And what this chart shows that only 100 years ago, and by the way, I used to think 100 years was a long time ago, but I got white hair now, I'm approaching 60. It's not that long a time frame. But only 100 years ago, the federal government was only 2% of our economy. In other words, 2 cents of every dollar our economy produced, the federal government consumed. Back then, state and local governments were 5% of our economy. That, I would argue, was the vision of our founding fathers. Very limited federal government. Limited within the constitutionally enumerated powers. And government where we needed it, and we need government, but that should be close to the government. Anybody here, well, I know we got a mayor here. Uh, any other, anybody else in, in the uh, school board or, or city council? If you are, I think you'd agree with me, local government is very accountable. If, let's say you're on a school board. If you're going to in, increase property taxes, you can pretty well be assured that probably in this town hall, you're going to have your citizens demanding that that property tax increase, if it's voted in, is going to be spent efficiently. Again, accountable government. You remove government to, let's say, Madison. A little less accountable, a little more out of control, but at least states, by and large, operate under the constraints of a balanced budget amendment or a law that requires them to balance budget every year. So state finances, although they got they're playing some games with pension liabilities, states are in far greater, far better financial shape than the federal government because you remove government to the alternate universe, the, the, the city in which I now serve, Washington D.C., and government becomes pretty unaccountable, pretty out of control, which is why we're our debt's approaching $18 trillion and exceeds the size of our economy. <coughs> so you can see the history. It, when I, you can see World War I, World War II, the spikes in spending, but overall, we've, over the last 100 years, government has just ratcheted up. It's just continued to grow. When I entered office, the federal government was consuming about 25% of our economy. Now, because of the 2010 election, because of a lot of fiscal conservatives like myself being elected, we've actually restrained the growth of government. We had a big spike between 2008 and 2009, about a half a trillion dollars, but now it's leveled off for a few years. Now, it's been a messy process. It's not the way I try and control it, but at least it's been controlled to some extent. Whoa, okay, I did something wrong. <laughs> okay, which is the, there we go, got it figured out. Okay. Um, our, our pro so we've actually backed Federal government spending down to about 20% level now, but it, you can see over the next uh, 20 some years, it's scheduled to increase to 20 to 30% of our economy. Now, you tack on state and local governments, we're already at 35% on trajectory at 45%. Now, why, why do I think this is a problem? Well, because nation states that have tried this have failed. Government is a horrible allocator of capital. It allocates capital based on political considerations, not economic. It's not like the private sector is perfect, but it's just a lot better than government. I mean, example, Soviet Union, they tried this, they no longer exist. I know Vladimir Putin's trying to reconstitute it, but the communist so Soviet Union failed. Venezuela is an oil-rich nation, but after a decade or so of, of Hugo Chavez's socialist experiment, it's an economic basket case, and I would venture to say probably not too many people here have ever vacationed in the island paradise of Cuba, after what the Castro brothers have done to, to that, what should be an island paradise. It's a real tragedy, it's not. And of course, we all saw a couple years ago the riots in the streets in Greece as that social welfare state was failing because of their debt crisis. So I don't know why anybody would want to put America on this path. This is the path we're on, and the sooner we get off it, I, I will say the better. Now, a lot of my charts and graphs are really meant to dispel some myths. You know, because I am a fiscal conservative, I get accused of all kinds of mean, nasty, ugly things, like wanting to put America on an austere spending path, or institute draconian cuts. So let's just look at the facts. Ten years ago, the federal government spent $2.3 trillion. The last decade, $3.5 trillion. And the argument moving forward is the House budget would propose spending $5 trillion 10 years in the future. That's not enough for President Obama to send the Democrats they want to spend 5.9. So again, what this chart shows is that nobody is proposing actually cutting federal government spending in total. What we're talking about is how do we restrain the rate of growth so we stabilize our debt deficit so we don't hit a debt crisis. Now, another way to look at this is spending over 10 years. Two decades ago, we spent $18 trillion over the 10-year period. The last decade, we spent $32 trillion. And again, the argument moving forward is the House proposal spending $43 trillion over the next decade. President Obama said Democrats want to spend forty nine. So if you've ever heard the term or the accusation against people like me that I want to institute $6 trillion in draconian cuts, 
That's what we're talking about. The difference between spending 43 and 49 trillion dollars over the next 10 years. It's not a cut, it's just restraining the rate of growth so we don't go bankrupt. Now, here's, here's a big part of the problem. There's so much the federal government is out of control. It's, it's not appropriate. It's, it's, it's mandatory. It's automatic spending. So you can see in the 60s, 68% of the federal budget was appropriate. That's the discretionary spending account. That's what we're always arguing over. That's the only thing we're really arguing over. And yet 32% was on automatic pilot. Back then it was primarily Social Security, but also interest on the debt. Now that, that's basically been reversed. So last year, only 35% of the budget was appropriate. The discretionary amount. That was about a trillion dollars. That's what all the budget fights was over just that trillion dollars out of a 3.5 trillion dollar year budget. In other words, 2.5 trillion was on automatic pilot. It was permanent law. The only way you change the course is you have to pass a law to change those mandatory programs. If we don't get this under control in 10 years, less than a quarter of the federal government's budget will be appropriate. You'll have 77% on an automatic pilot. Now, I come from the private sector. You guys have household budgets. If, if I ran a business this way, or you ran your household, where you basically said 65 to 77% of the budget is on automatic pilot, in other words, healthcare, spend whatever it takes. Retirement, sky's the limit. Your business would be bankrupt, you'd have zero employees, or you as an individual would be before a bankruptcy judge. But that's the way we're running, we're running, I put that in quotes, the federal budget. It's no, it's no way to conduct a nation's budget. <coughs> Uh, and by the way, I would argue we're basically bankrupt. The only reason we're not functionally bankrupt is we're still the world's reserve currency. We can keep interest rates artificially low, delay our day of reckoning, but I think we all realize that can't go on forever. No, nobody can predict how long it'll go on, but we certainly can say that this is gross fiscal mismanagement, and the sooner we, we start doing a better job, the, the better we're off we're all going to be now. I realized we were in trouble when we went from talking and being outraged politically by hundreds of billions of dollars worth of deficit and changed our denomination to trillion. I actually saw a bumper sticker that said, you know, please God, don't let Washington know what comes after trillion. <laughs> and I think it's a reasonably good comment. So this chart is really designed to personalize it. So what this shows is you take our debt divided by the population, every American share of the current federal debt is almost $55,000. You know, four years ago, I think it was around $39,000. Ten years in the future, it'll be about $75,000. Now, I actually give this PowerPoint presentation to high school seniors and some colleges, and when I'm talking to young people, I really encourage them to concentrate on that, that debt figure ten years in the future when you're out in the workforce, trying to provide for yourself and your family. And, and, and because you're young, what you ought to do is, to that $75,000, you ought to tack on $150,000 for your parents' share, $150,000 for your grandparents' share because the very sad fact is that debt's not going away. That debt is going to be shouldered by our kids, our grandkids, our great grandkids. Do you understand what, what we're doing to future generations? The intergenerational theft, how immoral it is? Now, I don't know a parent or parents that would willingly drive up their personal debt, max out their credit card, never intending to pay it off, but fully intending to pass on to kids and grandkids. Now, we don't do that on a personal basis. And yet, collectively, that's exactly what we're doing. And until we acknowledge that, until we collectively feel a little guilt over this intergenerational theft, theft until we take the first step in any problem-solving process, is admitting we have the problem, we're, 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 we're not going to be enacting solutions not to solve this problem. Now, I mentioned Greece earlier. On this, on this one metric, you'd actually be better off being a citizen of Greece because their, their share of their federal debt is where we were about four years ago. And again, the only reason we don't have riots in our streets is because we're the world's reserve currency. We can keep interest rates out artificially, though we can delay our day of reckoning, but not forever. I want to spend some time talking a little bit about Social Security. Now, I mean, it is true, before I ever even thought about running for Senate, I gave a little Tea Party speech and I. I refer to Social Security as a Ponzi scheme, and I, I, I paid the price politically during my election. But also let me admit, I was wrong, because a Ponzi scheme is illegal. <laughs> when the federal government runs a Ponzi scheme, it's legal. Now, again, I, I don't take pleasure in, in pointing that out, but it's just true. It's a very sad fact. Up until the year, through the year 2009, Social Security by and large ran a surplus. In other words, what it paid on benefits was lower than what it collected in payroll tax, the funding mechanism. But starting in 2010, when we did a payroll tax holiday, defunded the, started defunding the America's retirement plan, that payroll tax holiday is no longer in effect. 
But this is what's going to happen over the next 30 years according to the, the trust funds or CBO. Take your pick. Over the next 30 years, we're going to run a 12.7 to $14.6 trillion deficit in Social Security. In other words, Social Security will pay out almost $15 trillion more in benefits than it takes in the payroll tax. This is not a solvent system. This, and, and, and politicians that are, that are basically making the statement, I would say lying to the American public saying that Social Security is solvent to 2033, can only make that statement based on the fiction of the Social Security Trust Fund. But here's the problem with the trust fund. The, the, the reason I call it a fiction. The trust fund holds U.S. government bonds. And the problem with the government holding a U.S. government bond, a bond, U.S. government bond has no value to the federal government. The same thing as if you have $20, spent it, and that money spent, it is long gone. It, it funded it future benefit, or past benefits. But if you have $20, spent it, and then take out a note, write 20 bucks on it, stuff in your pocket, and say, I got 20 bucks. No, you don't. You have a piece of paper that you're going to have to take out of your pocket and convince somebody else to give you a real $20 and exchange for that promissory note. But I'm not the only one saying the trust fund has no value. The Office of Management Budget, which is part of every administration, basically says the same thing in their 2010 publication. They say, yeah, I mean, you've got balances there, but they'll pay benefits only in a bookkeeping sense. I mean, the OMB realized that the trust fund aren't, doesn't hold assets that can be drawn down to fund future benefits because you have an asset in the trust fund, $2.76 trillion of U.S. government bonds, but the Treasury Department holds a liability. When you consolidate the next the book the books of the federal government, that consolidation nets to zero. Now, in my budget committee, in, in hearings six times with high government officials, I tried to get them to admit that this consolidation effect nets to zero, even though it's in their own publication. Treasury Secretary Liu wouldn't admit it, acting OMB Director Zients wouldn't, uh, OMB nominee, and then Director Burwell wouldn't admit it. Finally, my fifth try. I learned how to sneak up on him. I, I, I talked to CBO in, in a hearing. I asked questions to CBO Director Elmendorf. I said, no, Director Elmendorf, I want to talk about the trust, Social Security Trust Fund. It holds $2.76 trillion of U.S. government bonds, right? He wasn't quite sure of the figures. He said, no, that's, that's the amount. I said, okay, yeah, but, and that's an asset to the trust fund, right? Yeah. So now, a U.S. government bond is a liability to the Treasury, right? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, it's a liability. $2.76 trillion liability. So what happens when you consolidate the set of books? And fortunately for me, fortunately for America, in this process of problem solving, admit we have a problem, both Director Elmendorf and Fed Chair Yellen, just a couple weeks ago, admitted, actually it said the magic word, you can sign the federal books, it nets to zero. Now again, I, I don't take pleasure in that fact, but unless we're willing to face that reality, we won't solve the long-term sustainability of Social Security. Now, I said it has no value, but it does exist. I got a picture of the trust fund. That's it right there. <laughs> That's it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a forger file located in, in, a, in the H.J. Hinkin building in Parkersville, West Virginia. <clears throat> and it would be funny if it weren't so tragic and sad. But this is what politicians are pointing to and, and claiming will sustain Social Security through the year 2033. <coughs> I mean, I would just consider that a falsehood. It's just not true. We're, we're pulling the wool over the American public. We're not admitting we have a problem. Again, <coughs> Unless you go through those first steps, first of all, admit you have a problem, and secondly, defining the problem. Now, I was one of those Republican senators that President Obama invited out to dinner. I appreciate the outreach, and the, the, the discussion was very frank. And then, you know, I, was, I would take some credit for prodding President Obama to make his staff available to try and find areas of agreement. And maybe we don't solve, solve the whole, whole problem, but how about at least move the football down the field? Let's agree. Let's figure out what we can agree on to start solving this huge debt deficit issue. So part, part of my input in that process was problem definition, problem solving. And so I, I argued, now first of all with my Republican colleagues, but then with the White House, is we don't have a 10-year budget window problem. That's how all the stuff is scored over 10 years, which makes sense. I mean, it's hard to project a year in the future, much less 10 or even 30. But the fact of the matter is, if you just look at 10 years, we dramatically understate the size of our problem because we really have a 30-year demographic problem. We have the baby boom generation. We're retiring to rate 10,000 people per day. We're going to live for another 30 years, hopefully. Um, and we've made all these promises of the baby boom generation, but we've not made provisions to pay for them. And so what we did is we did, a, we did a projection, and I'm not going to give you that, but I'm going to show you CBO figures. Because CBO has two projections. One's a baseline, 
One's they're called their ultimate fiscal scenario. Now, they don't do it in dollars. They do it as percentage GDP. And so I, I wanted something a little more authoritative than my own or our staff's projection. And so what we did is we converted the CBO's percentage GDP into numbers, because I think it's a little more understandable. So over the next 30 years, what I'm going to show you is the CBO's ultimate fiscal scenario converted to dollars. And, and what it shows is the first decade, $8 trillion of projected deficits. Now, nobody really did. This is pretty common across every scenario. Now, I don't know if we get by the next 10 years without, you know, without hitting a debt crisis. $8 trillion. Second decade, $31 trillion. The third decade, $88 trillion of deficits. For a whopping total over 30 years, $127 trillion. Now, I said 100 years, isn't lean, looking like that long a time period, 30 years? My, my little baby just turned 31 a couple weeks ago. That went by like that. We're gonna be on these, um, hitting or bumping against this reality a lot sooner than anybody's really thinking about right now. Now, I also realize trillions of dollars is incomprehensible. So let's put this in perspective. The entire net private asset base in the United States, in other words, the net assets of every business, large and small, every household is $106 trillion. So you don't have to be an accountant or economist to look at this and realize, yikes, we got a problem. Now, the CBO baseline shows about $66 trillion over the next 30 years. Our projection was 107. You know, I thought we hit a pretty, pretty, pretty good middle ground right there when we looked at it and the way we did our projections. So somewhere between 66, 107, 127 trillion dollars over the next 30 years, it's a problem we shouldn't be ignoring, but we are. Now, let, let me just tell you a quick little White House story. As part of those meetings, we, we're in the White House. I developed this projection, our 107 trillion dollar projection is what I was showing the White House. And President Obama came in the last half about a two hour meeting. He was sitting right here, I was sitting right there. But when I got to make my pitch, I really was asking the president, listen, we've, we've done this. We've come up with $107 trillion. We've put numbers to it. It's more, more understandable than unfunded liabilities and percentage of GDP. I said, Mr. President, you have to use your bully pulpit. You know, we'll be right there behind you. We'll go collectively in a bipartisan fashion the American public can describe the problem so we can collectively admit it so the American public's ready for solutions. So I, I made what I thought it was a pretty good sales pitch. And President Obama looked at me and said, Ron, I said, we can't show the American public that those kind of numbers. If we do, they'll throw, they'll throw up their hands and give up all hope, which is, which is a legitimate point. I mean, how do you break the news to the American public when, when politicians from both parties have been lying to them for decades? But here's the more depressing fact. He went on to say, besides, Ron, you know, we can't do all the work here. We've got to leave some work for future, future presidents and future congresses. Now, from my standpoint, that's pretty deflating. <laughs> You know, we were in the White House later during the, the, uh, the government shutdown. I made the same plea. And I got no response from him that time. We just moved on to the next senator. So, again, we're going to have a tough time solving these problems if we don't have the president, if we don't have enough members of Congress that are really, really willing to tell the American people the truth, if we don't have a population that understands the situation. We've got a real hard time solving these problems. Like, if that wasn't depressing enough for you, that, if that doesn't keep you awake at night, this one will. This is what I call a graphic depiction of a debt crisis. What it shows is that from 1970 to 1999, the average interest rate the federal government paid in this debt was 5.3%. Pretty reasonable interest rate, right? If you've got a mortgage, you're probably paying it close to that, plus or minus 1 or 2%. By the way, back then, we were a far more creditworthy nation. Back then, our debt to GDP ratio was between 40 and 67%. Now it's over 100% because our debt is larger than our economy. The last four years, because we're the world's reserve currency, we've been keeping interest rates artificially low so the federal government doesn't feel the pain of, the fisc of this fiscal mismanagement. But you know there are victims here? You know, if you're a senior on a fixed income, you, know, you maybe had an annuity paying 6%, you rolled over into what? Now what can you get for a risk-free asset? If you're a young person recognizing how unsustainable Social Security and Medicare is, you're trying to save for your retirement, what, what can you put your risk-free portion of your portfolio in? And it, realize the benefit of any kind of compound interest rates. So there are real victims to this, but of course government doesn't want to feel the pain of its fiscal mismanagement, so we've been keeping interest rates out of here low. What's a debt crisis? Well, what's, what, what sparks debt crisis is when creditors from around the world look at the United States and realize, you know, you guys aren't taking this very seriously. You're not really addressing the problem here. You're a credit risk. I'm not going to loan you money anymore. Certainly not at that rate. 
Of course, that's what happened to Spain and Italy and Portugal and, and Greece and Ireland. We're not immune, not forever. If, if we were to just return to that very reasonable interest rate of 5.3%, you know what that adds to our interest expense every year? $650 billion. Now, we're already paying about $250 billion in interest every year. So 650, 65% of discretionary spending amount I'm talking about. Added to our current interest rate, you're talking about 900 billion. 90% of discretionary spending. So that's not just a debt crisis, that's a political crisis. Is, is that interest payment, which would have to be paid, starts crowding out all this other spending that, trust me, Americans are addicted to. And they have come to expect. That's what we're trying to hold off the past here. That's what we're trying to address before, before that debt crisis occurs. So, this is the end of my, my budget charts. I've got two more sets of charts. And they're really designed to get people to think about the negative unintended consequences of good intentions. And the first one really has to do with uh, something, an issue that I, I hope college kids, when I present this, uh, this to them, are, are interested in. They're, they're across to college. And what this chart shows is that in the 60s, one year in college, that's room, board, and tuition, was 11000 bucks. Now, had, had that cost of college just increased by the rate of inflation today, the cost of college for one year would be about 7000 But in fact, it's over 17000 The cost of college has increased almost two and a half times the rate of inflation. Also recognize, two of those components for room and board, for the rest of the economy, they've actually increased it less than the rate of inflation because we've gotten a lot more effective at growing crops, providing food, and building homes and shelter. So the cost of college has actually increased at a greater rate than the, even the two and a half times of inflation. Why? Let me ask you, why? What is so different about what college education, well, we'll get, we'll get to it when we, you know, I'll give you a chance to chime in. Um, lost my train of thought. Um, okay, what is so different about what college and, and universities spend their money on that their costs would increase 2.4 times rate of inflation? Or